I'm in the very happy position to have with me Dr. Elisa Granato, molecular microbiologist and the first ever FEMS Early Career Microbiologist Awardee. I have so many things that I want to ask you today, but I think let's uh, start simple. A few questions to get to know you perhaps. Um, where are you currently based and what is it like being a scientist there? Yeah, so I'm currently based at the University of Oxford and I'm a joint member of two different departments at Oxford. So one is the Department of Zoology and one is the Department of Biochemistry. And uh, yeah, being a scientist at Oxford is really, it's quite amazing. It's a very beautiful city. It's a very old city. There's a lot of really old colleges and many different departments also that are very like physically close to each other, which is great because you can pretty much walk or cycle everywhere, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is always a lot of fun because it's not unusual to like see students or scientists walking around town or cycling around town with their samples. You know? <laughs> um, so it feels like a place that's very infused with science and with students. And I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm also very lucky to be surrounded by very supportive people, both in and outside of my group. So it feels like a very kind of warm working mm -hmm. environment overall. So yeah. So can you tell us a little bit of about the stage of career you're in so our listeners know uh, what you're doing. Sure, yeah. So I guess you could call me a senior postdoc at this point, which always makes me feel very old when I say that, but I guess it's true. So I did my PhD, I finished my PhD in 2017, which was almost four years ago. Um, and so I did my PhD in Switzerland um, and that took like four and a half years or so. And then after that, I moved to the UK to do my first postdoc. Um, and that took roughly three years. Um, during the time I worked with a group here at Oxford with Professor Kevin Foster. And then now I recently got a fellowship to kind of develop my own more independent research. And I just started that. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm at that transition point between kind of the first postdoc where you um, gain more independence, but you're still kind of working really closely with a PI. And now I'm transitioning into that phase where I'm kind of doing my own thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. Yeah, I mean, I would like to wish you good luck in that. I know it's a, Thank you. a very important stage of your career. So It's also very scary, <laughs> but that's normal. I mean, that's what I keep hearing from other people. It's like, um, yeah, you can rely kind of less on the guidance of other people. You have to do, you have to take more responsibility mm -hmm. about, your, you know, with respect to your own project and this kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Do you think this is kind of the hardest challenge so far that you had in your research <laughs> career? I don't know. It's like every stage of your career has its own set of challenges. So I don't know if that's necessarily the hardest, like doing your PhD is a, can be a huge challenge. Doing your first postdoc can be a huge challenge. Like um, and being an undergrad has its own huge challenges. So it's just that the nature of these challenges change over time, right? So in your PhD, the biggest challenge is usually just like getting used to the process of being a scientist, which usually means getting used to feeling very stupid all the time, you know, um, making mistakes all the time, failing pretty much at everything <laughs> in the beginning. And that's totally normal, but that can be like mentally a huge challenge. And it is for mm -hmm. a lot of people. And it certainly was for me. So you have to like, usually what happens during your PhD is that you kind of over time get used to this, you know, process of just repeatedly failing at things and realizing, Hey, this is normal. And then <laughs> as a postdoc, the biggest challenge is usually like, okay, now I have more independence, right? Which is great. You usually have more freedom to pursue your own things maybe, but that can also be kind of scary. Usually people tend to have more guidance in your PhD. So maybe the idea came from your PI and then you're in quotes kind of only executing it. And that can be mm -hmm. great in terms of structure, you know, you know what you're going to do. And then as a postdoc, you usually have more freedom. So it's kind of like gaining a set of skills that allows you to come up with your own ideas and come up with your own, you know, experiments and this kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So it's always a great learning experience, but that can also be a challenge, of course. Every learning experience starts as a scary challenge. And so yeah. where, I'm, where I'm at now is basically the next level of independence, right? Like now it's okay, you have to write your, you have to come up with your own ideas for a grant, you know, and that's what I did. And of course you still get help from other people, but it's still kind of your own brain baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I like to call it. And then if you're lucky, you get money to, to pursue that project and or to pursue those questions. And then it's all on you, right? So now everyone's looking at you like, okay, so this was your own idea. You're going to do it on your own. How's that going? <laughs> you know? mm. um, so that's kind of the challenge right now to deal with that kind of pressure and to, um, yeah, kind of find my own mm -hmm. niche, I guess, now that I'm gaining yeah. more independence. Mm. Um, I mean, going 
a bit lighter mood now because I think I gave you kind of a hard question to start. <laughs> um, so what is your daily routine? How do you start your day? How do I start my day? I mean, usually, uh, usually I oversleep. I try to get up earlier, <laughs> but I tend to like sleep in a little bit. Then I actually, I'm, I like, I try to be pretty organized with my day. So usually I have an idea of what I'm going to do. Let's say I go to the lab in the morning. So I know when I need to show up, I do, I maybe start an experiment. Um, then I usually have lunch um, at the lab. I mean, not in the lab, but like in the building. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, it kind of depends. Like some days I'm in the lab pretty much all day. Some days I'm just doing home office and analyzing things. Some days it's a mixture of that. Some days I maybe give a talk in the morning, then I go to the lab in the afternoon. That's also a degree of freedom that I really enjoy. Um, so actually there's, I guess the answer should have been, there's no such thing as an average daily routine because every day is so <laughs> different. Um, and uh, yeah, so sometimes it's also like, okay, I'm just not feeling well. I'm going to take the morning off, you know, but then gonna, I'm going to come in Saturday morning or whatever to, to make up for that. Mm -hmm. So I really, really enjoy just kind of going with the flow, seeing what I feel like, you know, doing tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And mm -hmm. then, um, yeah, and then kind of structuring my day around that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And I think you are active on Twitter mostly, right? I guess I am. Yes. Um, <laughs> So Eliza has a Twitter account. If any of you wants to follow her and her journey, uh, your account is at uh, Procariota, right? Correct. Uh, yes. Nice. So yeah, if you want to follow her journey <laughs> at Procariota on Twitter, uh, but FYI, if you do that, Eliza is a cat lover. So often the spotlight goes to her adorable cat in Oxford. I have two cats. Um, I adopted them when I lived in Switzerland. So this was a while ago, um, like five or six years ago. Um, I have a female and a male. They're mother and son, actually. Uh, which is a funny story, because when I adopted them, um, there was a bit of a mix up because it was a a mom, dad, and then three kittens situation. And I was actually interested in getting um, the mom and the dad, so a male and a female, but they all look completely the same. They're all completely gray. And then they ended up giving me a mother and uh, one of her sons. And then we realized like weeks after you know, the adoption took place, they, they called me like, hey, we gave you the wrong cat. <laughs> anyway, now it's too late, I guess. Okay, it's fine. Um, it's just sort of unusual because usually a mom and there's a mom and son wouldn't get along necessarily but mm. they they're totally fine so it worked out well um anyway yes yeah, so the female is uh how old is she now uh 11 and this her son is a year younger so he's 10 so they're getting kind of old right now actually <laughs> they're almost yeah. officially classified as senior cats but i'm hoping they'll stick around for a while longer um i mean the breed can can get up to 18 years old i think on average mm -hmm. so hoping hoping that can get many more <laughs> many more wonderful years with them. Yeah, and having having the, those cats has been great, honestly. Also, like, I live alone and uh, it's really nice to have, you know, just someone to, yeah, kind of interact with, you know, at the end of the mm. day, even if it's just an animal, <laughs> even if they don't talk back. <laughs> but it's really nice to just have, just have company, you know. And uh, yeah, they've also been really great for my mental health. Um, mm -hmm. Um, cause being a scientist can be very stressful at times and it's really nice to have that, you know, kind of support from a, you know, a companion animal and, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And of course it also, they're also just funny, silly. They make me laugh every day and that's where it all started. Like just posting, you know, mm -hmm. silly, silly pictures of them on Twitter. <laughs> cause I realized like, Hey, maybe other people will enjoy the silliness as well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's when it kind of, kind of took off. And it's always, it always brings me a lot of joy when people say that they enjoy my cat pictures. Cause I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. they, yeah, they bring me so much happiness that it's always great to like be able to share yeah. that a little bit. And I, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I've seen <laughs> yeah. you kind of moved to three or four different countries throughout your academic year, right? Yeah, so I've lived and worked in three countries. So I started in Germany. I was born in Munich. Um, so I did my undergrad there. I did my bachelor's there in biology. And then I moved uh, to Switzerland to do my master's and PhD. And uh, that's where I adopted the cats. <laughs> So they didn't have to do that first move, at least. And then I moved from Switzerland to the UK after my PhD. And uh, I was just kind of uh, pointing that question to maybe talking about a little bit about research, the international nature of research. And, you know, as 
as you progress to different stages of career, you often need to switch institutions, switch countries. So um, do you, if you have anything to share with us, it would be really nice to learn how, how you experienced that shift. Yeah, it's interesting because it's not only about shifting or switching countries, so to speak. And of course, that comes with a cultural shift, right? Like, I mean, language, you know, culture, social rules and this kind of stuff. But it also comes with a shift in departmental culture. So even when you move from department to department within a country, that can be a huge shift because different departments or different groups have different, you know, vibes, different levels of hierarchy or not, different levels of cooperation or competition you know, among their members. And it's really also about figuring out, um, I mean, first of all, making a choice of where to go, right? Figuring out what's a good vibe for you, what's a, a social environment that works for you in terms of how people interact with each other, how people treat with each other, what's the chemistry like, right? Um, but after you made a choice and um, you decided where to go, it's all about kind of figuring out, yeah, like what are the local rules? How, how do people you know, interact with each other? How do I fit in? How can I bring my own voice to this? Um, what can also be really useful is like figure out what you liked at a place and then try to bring that to the next place if they don't have that yet, you know, whatever that is, it can be like a way to do a group meeting or it can be a fun thing to do, you know, for socializing or whatever. Um, every place has something to offer <laughs> in terms of, um, yeah, positive, um, I don't know, like strategies that work or positive interactions or something like that. And if you can re remember that and then bring that to your next place, that can be a very, a very positive mm -hmm. thing. Um, and the, also the opposite, if you were unhappy at a place, try to figure out why. <laughs> and then if you move to a new place, try to maybe avoid that or learn from that or try to, you know, um, prevent people from making those same mistakes at your new place, something like that. So it's all about learning mm -hmm. and growing and figuring out what works and doesn't work. I mean, at this point, I've been to so many places that I have a mental list you know, um, in my mind of like things that work, things that don't work, you know, when it comes to, you know, research culture and um, group interactions and this kind of stuff. And that's really the upside of moving and living in mm -hmm. a lot of places that you get a really good comprehensive picture of what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm hoping this will help me in the future when it comes to like building my own group. Um, that I've seen so many different versions of scientific departments, of groups and social interactions and this kind of stuff that's probably hopefully going to help me set up an environment that's inclusive and fun and productive, you know, and people are not to too stressed, you know, people don't overwork and this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, we have a lot of early career researchers who are listening. Uh, so I guess this, this might be a bit comforting nice to hear tips from you especially as you are you, you're going through that stage so thank you for that um so eliza elisa you're the fem's early career microbiologist our d the first one ever uh for this award um recognizing an excellent body of microbiology research research potential and contribution to your society um, first of all, I want to learn, how did you feel when you first learned that you were selected for this award? <laughs> Honestly, I was kind of like, not in denial, but I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like I saw the email and I thought like, oh, I don't know. Like I, I saw it and didn't, it didn't really register. So I kind of clicked on it, clicked away and like went on about my day for a few hours, which sounds weird, but then it kind of had to set in like, oh wait, this actually happened. And then I went back to the email, like what? wait, I actually got it. <laughs> I don't know, somehow my brain wasn't processing it uh, correctly the first time. But yeah, and then I was just elated. Honestly, I just I kind of freaked out. I jumped up and down. I was like, Wee! unfortunately, no one was there in the lab with me at the time. So I wasn't <laughs> able to like share it with anyone, but I just like danced around like a maniac. And it just came as a huge surprise. Honestly, I was like, yeah, this thing happened. I mean, I know about the nominations and about the nomination and stuff, but I was 100% sure, you know, someone else was going to get it because I know so many people who are like, yeah, just so amazingly talented, you know, and brilliant and who like, yeah, you know, I always feel like do way, you know, way better and more impactful research. And um, so I was honestly very surprised. Um, but of course, it's also, it feels great, you know, to be recognized. Um, it's a huge honor. Also, the fact that it's the first time this award was even given, you know, so it feels very special. And uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful that, you know, someone thought that I, <laughs> that my work deserves it. And of course, I'm very proud of what I'm, of what I'm doing and what I've achieved. But I just feel like I'm, yeah. 
I'm, I'm just surrounded by so many, so many amazing and brilliant people that to be recognized in that way feels very, yeah, mm -hmm. just feels very special. And yeah, very yeah. grateful. Again, huge congratulations from me. Thank from you. The of um, can you tell me a little bit about the research that helped you uh, reach this award? Yeah, so basically the, the, the main thread, I guess, of my research interests um, over the last few years was bacterial interactions. So historically, I think people have sometimes assumed that bacteria are kind of these isolated cells that just kind of do their thing, you know, little machines, you know, not very social, like maybe animals are. But we now know that that's very much untrue. Bacteria interact a lot. Bacteria can be super social. And um, basically, I was lucky to be able to work on um, different aspects of these bacterial interactions during my PhD, my postdoctoral work. In my PhD, I focused on cooperation, so basically how bacteria help each other, <laughs> how they can play nice and achieve great things by working together. And I looked at how these things evolve over time during my PhD and also how cooperation affects virulence. So how much damage a pathogen is going to cause in the host basically by cooperating or not. Um, so that was basically my PhD work. And then when I moved to the UK to do my postdoc, um, I wanted to see kind of the flip side of bacterial interaction. So I got really interested in bacteria, how bacteria compete with each other, how they kill each other. And so um, I worked on a project over the last few years where we looked at a very extreme competition strategy in E. coli, which is um, essentially cell suicidal toxin release. So some bacteria lies on mass to release uh, anti-competitor toxins. And uh, we were able to show that that mostly happens when bacteria experience a lethal attack by a competitor. So it's a super extreme response to an extremely lethal attack. Um, so that was what I was working on over the last few years. And that's the project I just finished. And uh, yeah, that's essentially the, the quick summary of what I did mm -hmm. over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is this something that you are going to continue or are you looking to um, kind of go into different avenues? Um, a little bit of both. So I want to keep working on uh, bacterial killing mechanisms because I just think it's it's a super exciting field. There's also a lot of new science coming out kind of every day. It's very, yeah, it's very active, very dynamic field with a lot of um, young PIs too, which I think is great. So I'm hoping we can all you know, kind of push this field um, forward a little bit. And uh, I want to bring in a new spin. So I've been recently really obsessed with horizontal gene transfer, <laughs> which is basically bacteria um, kind of exchanging genes laterally with each other. So genes moving through populations. And I think that's super exciting because it, um, it also brings in this concept of kind of multi-level selection. So selection on the gene level versus selection on the bacterial level. So lots of cool evolutionary questions that can be answered by looking at this mechanism. So I want to bring together bacteria killing each other and bacteria exchanging genes horizontally. And um, that's actually what my fellowship is all about. So when I kind of merge these two fields, merge these two disciplines, and then do cool science, hopefully, <laughs> at mm -hmm. the intersection between these two topics. So I want to bring killing mechanisms um, together with um, horizontal gene transfer. Let's mm -hmm. See where that leads me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good luck with that. I know. Thank um, you. <laughs> I know it's a bit difficult now that you say you are a bit more independent, perhaps uh, figuring out what you really want to focus on and stuff like that. Yeah, and these th things can still change too. Like there's a bunch of um, examples in the field where people thought they were gonna do this, you know, but then something really cool happened a year into the project and then they go into a diff completely different direction. So it's also very important in science to always be open to the next cool thing. Cause sometimes your original plan just didn't work out and that's totally fine, <laughs> that's science. <laughs> and then as long as your mind is open to like cool discoveries on the way, you can also, you know, switch directions. So who knows what I'm gonna do in five years, but that's my plan for now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just started being at the stage. So you said senior postdoc fellow, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> this might sound a bit of a weird question, but um, what are the next steps that you're looking to do uh, in your career? You mentioned having uh, your own lab. Is that still? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely the vision. Um, so I'm hoping that I can use those next few years where I'm still in my fellowship to kind of, yeah, carve out my own niche, get um, really cool results in this kind of new field that I'm, yeah, hoping, not, not new field, but like a new direction that I'm hoping to get started um, in this fellowship. And then um, 
either apply for more permanent or assistant professor type jobs, maybe in the UK or in other countries. I'm actually open to moving to a different place in Europe. Um, of course, my home country is Germany, and I also spend a lot of time in Switzerland. So going back to either Germany or Switzerland would be, I think, a really obvious next move to me. And that'd be great if that works out. But if that doesn't work out, I'm also open to like other countries. So um, and uh, yeah, and then hopefully start my group. So that's going to be very exciting and also very terrifying. <laughs> Again, like I said earlier, every step has its own challenges and like things to be afraid of. <laughs> but that's mm -hmm. also the beauty, like it never gets boring. You know, you always um, I think that's really one of the upsides of this kind of career path. If you want to call it an upside, there's a challenge around every corner, you know, and if you if you find ways of like sustainably getting through those challenges, it's such an amazing, you know, growing experience, like in terms of personal growth. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the challenge of having my own set of students, you know, working with young scientists, mentoring them, you know, helping them develop their own ideas and hopefully turn them into, you know, <laughs> amazing scientists one day. And um, yeah, so mm -hmm. it's a huge, it's going to be a huge challenge the next few years, but I'm so looking forward and I can't wait to get started. Yeah, I can feel a lot of positivity in you, Elisa. So <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I just hope everything turns all right, you know. Um, Thank with, you. Uh, being in the lab experience, a lot of things uh, might not work, but I'm sure, you know, if you've been persistent, then you, you'll, you'll reach to, to a very good result. Um, Hopefully, fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've reached to the, the last question uh, that I have for you today, which is, again, on a, on a positive note, uh, and getting going back a little bit as well. So what inspired you to get into microbiology in the first place? Yeah, it's funny, because I actually kind of got into microbiology by accident initially. And I think that's actually true for a lot of people, <laughs> I think it's actually quite rare. I mean, just based on my conversations with other scientists that people knew from the beginning, this is what they're gonna do and that's what happened. I mean, that can happen to some people, but it didn't happen. It was not the case at all for me. So when I started um, my bachelor's in biology, I wanted to become a behavioral scientist at first. I thought it was gonna do um, animal behavior. I was really into, yeah, just large animals, mammals and this kind of stuff. So my vision back then was that I was gonna be a behavioral scientist. I was gonna study maybe like lions in the savannah or something. So this is where I started. But then I just ended up taking this really, really good introductory course in microbiology in my bachelor's. And that completely changed my mind about everything essentially. So I immediately just fell in love with microbes um, and all the amazing things they can do. And then I basically said like, hey, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life, period. <laughs> like I got so excited about microbes. And uh, I also immediately then decided to specialize further in microbiology. So I ended up moving countries just uh, because they had a really good master's in microbiology in Switzerland. And they didn't at the time in Germany really. Um, so because I was so motivated to like really get into microbiology as fast as I could and then I also ended up doing my PhD there in Switzerland also in microbiology and then yeah I haven't looked back since <laughs> so I'm hoping I get I still get to work with with microbes for for a few more years <laughs> or decades mm -hmm. hopefully <laughs> yeah. I mean thank you so much for for your time today sharing all these amazing stories tips of your feelings really with us today. Uh, it's been such an interesting discussion. Thanks for having me. This was a blast.